motherhood, but not quite as we imagine. Thought-provoking, refreshing, straightforward, sometimes taboo. Often seemingly ordinary, but always honest. Welcome to School for Mothers, opening conversations we all need to have, exploring ways in which you can be fulfilled as a woman, once a mother. Now, here is your host, mother of 10, Danusha Melina Durban. Hello and welcome back to the School for Mothers podcast. I'm Danusha Melina Durban, your host. Let's dive into today's episode. Welcome to the School for Mothers podcast, Kay. I am really looking forward to discussing nerve with you. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm a bit nervous about talking about nerve. Oh, I love that. Yes, (laughs) ironically, it is really funny. I actually felt the same. (laughs) So it's managed to generate nerves in us. Oh, I love it. I know. You think, well, I live up to this. Do I have the, the backbone for this conversation? I don't know. Well, you know, I've got a really funny feeling you have more than enough for this conversation. Now, recently you published Still Hot, yeah? Yeah, co-authored, uh-huh. I have to say, Vicky Allen, my wonderful co-author, who I must credit. Isn't Vicky wonderful? She's, she really uh, is. Yeah, she really is. Yeah, we recently, oh my goodness, I love this kind of thing. Was that your doorbell? Um, no, it wasn't. It was my blooming awful ring because I'm deaf as a post. It's now on silent, I promise you. It, it's actually <laughs> oh, my no, text. funny. I am. Um, my children <laughs> take the mickey out of me, something awful. <laughs> do they? Oh, well, that's just, the, you know, general territory, isn't yeah. it? We often have deliveries, that's all, on, on the show. You know, people oh, have... <laughs> yes, exactly. And one, one episode, we had a dog licking very loudly. And I had to actually stop the interview and say, have you got something going on that I need that, to know about? Yeah, that could be a bit uncomfortable, that one. <laughs> yes, <so laughs> that one needs explanation. Exactly, you know, it's that kind of uh, podcast. So... Anyway, so <laughs> you have a wonderful book called Still Hot Out. And I wonder what it, what kind of nerve it takes to come out as a menopausal woman. Well, you know, it's really interesting because I think it would be different for different people. I mean, uh, as you might know, I am a regular on Loose Women. And um, for many of my colleagues and friends on there, it doesn't take anything at all because, as they will jokingly say, they're professional oversharers. And they're very comfortable about, you know, talking about very personal things. Um, I am not, you know, I mean, I am a journalist by, by training and for many more years than I care to remember. And I'm generally pretty good at asking questions. I'd like to think, but I'm not so good at answering them. And I tend to sort of stay away from personal stuff. Now, I don't know, Calvinistic, Scottish upbringing, you know, Hmm. we'd have to put me on the couch to work it out, but um, it's just kind of the way I am. So for me, it, it did take quite a bit of nerve because I tend to try and sort of protect my personal space a little bit. So That was a big decision. And then the other decision, you know, I mean, this sounds ridiculous. People are making really big decisions in their lives. But in terms of getting involved with a a book like this, I had, and I say this in the foreword, you know, kind of distanced myself from the menopause, which I now absolutely recognize as laughable, as if I'm some kind of, you know, different creature or something. How could Hmm. I, as a female at my age? But I was kind of brought up with fairly negative connotations attached to age by my mum, my wonderful mum, who is no longer with us, sadly. But she was one of those indomitable spirits who refused to recognise age. I mean, at the age of 80, she was still full-time running a business, uh, a wonderful spirit, but she just didn't like any reference to her age. She really didn't. And although I used to joke about that with her as a child, it obviously seeped in. And then there is that other connection between the menopause and age, you know, as a woman. And I think, you know, doing a bit of sort of self-analysis, I did internalize that. And I feel a little bit ashamed of it, to be honest, because I shouldn't really attach negativity to getting older as a woman and going through a natural process as the menopause is. But I had. And so for me, I did have to put my big girl pants on, take a deep breath and look in the mirror and say, sorry, kid, you are a menopausal woman and there is no point in denying it anymore. (laughs) You're not doing yourself or anyone else any favors here. So that was the element of nerve that I had to kind of apply to it. It's quite complex, isn't it? Because we have to unpack that internalized 
uh, negativity and deal with that. And, and it's so embedded, isn't it? That why should age really and honestly make a difference? Mm. Yet in within that is the denial of actually where we are and the experience that we bring and all that, you know, all that that means. So it's, it's kind of double-edged, isn't it? Well, it is. And I mean, I don't know much about American culture and, and probably the American culture I've been exposed to in the last four years, like everyone else, isn't very representative. But the one thing you do notice, you like Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House. I think she's in her early 80s. Nancy Pelosi are certainly getting um, close to it. Judge Bader Ginsburg, you know, seen as a great intellect. She was late 80s, wasn't she? Maybe even into her 90s. There just doesn't seem to be that same feeling of, you know, you've you've expired <laughs> that we tend to, to, to yes. have here. And, and I really do applaud that. Yeah, I mean, that expiry date, that done and dusted, that kind of dried up. Dried prune. up. Oh, my goodness, that's it. Dried it's up. A, it is, isn't it? Yeah. It's like lost all your juice, you're done, you're yeah. invisible. You just need to go sit with your cosy slippers and shut the fuck up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, that exactly. kind of go, it's for the young uns. It's not for you. <laughs> There's one of our contributors to a book, and I apologize because I, I, off the top of my head, I can't think who it was, but I, I loved their contribution. And what they said was that they saw a link between the menopause and mother-in-law jokes. And if you think of the years of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even now we do mother-in-law jokes. I mean, there's this immediate image in your head, isn't there, of a kind of buxom, um, you know, whiskery. It's almost like <laughs> um, the sort of matriarch in Mrs. Brown's Boys, you know. Oh, it is. That, that kind of figure who's a bit of the butt of jokes. Nobody would ever shag them. Oh, my God, you wouldn't touch them. You know, it's well, just their vagina's of, gone, surely. Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. The Gobi Desert. And, you know, all of those associations just come up um, and it's incredibly negative. I had a really interesting conversation the other day with um, Baroness Saida Warsi, who, again, contributes to the, the book. And I actually hadn't spoken to her before. And my goodness, what a dynamo she is. She was really good to speak to, really good to speak to. And I was saying to her, you know, well, thank you very much for contributing to the book, because although, you know, we had lots of contributors, it is more difficult to get women who are in the business world, the sort of yes. sharp end of the corporate world that is still much more male dominated. Um, and I'm interested in that. And obviously she's in, in politics, you know, so she's in a very sort of male dominated, suited kind of world. And, and she says that she's always faced a, a kind of distaste when she brings her personal experience to, to anything, whether it's the menopause or, or other elements of, of her life. And, you know, she says she sees it as weaponized misogyny. I love that expression. Yeah, it's a great one. Isn't yes. it good? Weaponized oh, yes. misogyny. And, and, you know, she did experience as she was going through the menopause occasions where she'd be standing in the House of Lords and she was giving the big speech and, oh my God, her words just went. Or she had that absolute brain fade. What am I doing here? What am I supposed to be talking about? Or she just felt a sort of uncontrollable rage, um, which wasn't really kind of justified by the situation. Um which comes with, with a change in, in your hormones. But then you're not supposed to talk about that. You're just supposed to kind of shove that down. Why should you shove that down? Well, I think because those contexts, I mean, I, I don't live in the House of Commons or, you know, um, having been there, but I don't work there, but I do work in boardrooms. And so I know that when I had my triplets seven years ago, that the boards that I was consulting with absolutely forgot that I was pregnant. I mean, I know it because they were asking me to work when the babies were first born at 29 weeks. And they wow. were still forgetting that I was actually a woman. I've had boards say to me, m chair men say, oh my God, you're a woman, Dinesh, because I didn't, I didn't wear a jacket once. <laughs> they were like, oh my God, you're a woman. I was like, what? Has it only just hit you that I'm a woman? So there's this kind of they're so used to this 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 masculine uh, environment that <laughs> you know that that's the ideal worker isn't it a man a white male let's just be really specific and somehow some women sneak in you know somehow mm. probably with some traits that uh, you know and and 
massive hard work. We know that. And then it's surprising to these men when something like the obvious things like pregnancy, menopause, they only know that in their domestic sphere. They don't see it in a business one. So it is, it's shocking that it has to be uh, sat on it. You have to be quiet. You, yep. I can tell you that most of my clients didn't know I had 10 kids. They didn't even know that mm. I was a mother at all, let alone 10. I've had them say, "That's a." have heard something weird about you. So, <laughs> yeah, which bit? <laughs> you know, pray tell. <laughs> but I'm, you're reminding me of something that I was uh, really impressed by when I was when I was seeing, uh, looking at your career. Now we're talking about MPs and politicians. You asked Maggie Thatcher back in 1986. Oh goodness! Yeah, going back now. Yeah, yeah, going right back. <laughs> do you have any regrets about a time when you didn't have the nerve to do something? Oh, when I didn't have the nerve to do something. Yeah, well, you asked her all about having the nerve. Mm. <laughs> you did. I was well, like, wow. And I? by the way, yeah, you did. You asked her about, does it get on your nerves being surrounded by men all the time? Because you were so dogged. I adored your interview. By the way, I didn't see it back in the 80s. Oh. But honestly, Dinesha, it was the worst interview ever broadcast. And I'm the (laughs) first one to say it. You know, it it really was. And actually, this wasn't really nerve, I wouldn't call it. It was probably a youthful uh, chutzpah or whatever. Um, I think that was... What's the difference, Kay? What's the difference? Well, there's a good question. There's a good question. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I was like 23 or something in my first job and I, I wanted to impress the boss, you know, and I thought, what can I do? What can I do? Um, and of course, you know, the representation of women at that time in politics was far, far less than, than it is now. So it was... It was I, I, a subject of discussion. And so I wanted to do a documentary about uh, women in politics and I got that through. And then I thought, right, how can I impress here? And I thought, I know, I'll write to Margaret Thatcher, oh, yeah. um, the naivety of it all, to see if she'll do an interview. And of course, she was uh, the Iron Lady at the time. She was in number 10. And so I wrote off to her press uh, secretary, Bernard Ingham, and was absolutely gobsmacked when they came back and said, yes, that's fine. It'll be an hour at Downing Street on such and such a date. <laughs> and that was it. But isn't that enormous nerve? I know you've converted to youthful chutzpah and like a gaucheness, et cetera, a naivety that you could even get it done. But isn't that in the core of, you know, kind of this this nerve to do things? Yeah, well, I absolutely give credit to that to my my mum, you know. I mean, she was a remarkable woman, you know, to me. But, you know, beyond that, you know, Central Scotland is not necessarily, certainly at the time she was growing up, a particularly aspirational place from a very working class background. Her dad was a miner, mum was a horse but all cleaner, my granny. Uh, but she and my dad set up a, a business uh, together. And it's quite odd. I've actually been working on another project at, at the moment, talking to women about quite intimate things. And mm. so I'm speaking to a lot of women who are around the same age as me and talking to them about their upbringing. And for many of them, it's it was quite a sort of repressed, almost Victorian kind of upbringing, you know, no sense of aspiration at all, you know, just sort of keep your head down, plow on, particularly as a woman, don't rattle any cages. And I think, gosh, I can't believe you're the same age as me because my mum and dad were so not like that. You know, I mean, my mum told me I could do anything, oh. you know, and when I eventually said that I was going to have my first child at the age of 39, I think she was a bit disappointed because she thought I was going to be prime minister and she thought a kid might get in the way. By the way, the child <laughs> Long and she adored it much more than she ever adored me. But, you know, I really was infused with that. And it's only now when I look back that I realise that at that time, that wasn't that common. Yeah, what a gift. I mean, and so counter, counter kind of culture. Yeah. That you were, as you say, infused with that aspirational, like, go for it. There's nothing that's that's impossible for you. Yeah. How how did she get that, Kay? I don't know. How did she get that? Um, Yeah. 
you know, because it's it's funny, isn't it? I mean, I often get asked the question, you know, who's the most impressive person that you've interviewed? Who's the most impressive person that you've met? And, and you know that the interviewer is looking for somebody famous. You know they're looking for a celebrity. How bloody boring. I know. And, <laughs> and I guess it's because, you know, it's obvious because so, people will recognise the name and they'll go, where if I say, well, it's Harriet Jones, they'll say, well, who the hell's that? But especially doing my radio work, I interview so many people who will never be famous, who will never be known, but who I am listening to thinking, my God, you are amazing. And my mum would be one of those. My mum's, you know, is never going to be known to to many other people, um, is never going to have that level of celebrity. But of her age and where she was brought up, she was actually quite extraordinary. And there will be lots and lots of extraordinary people, men and women, but if we're focusing on women, that you will never hear of that actually in terms of the people that we then know as celebrities, that they would knock them into a cock hat. I, I have met that. more celebrities that I'm not impressed by than I am impressed by, to be perfectly honest. Why do you think that is? What is, what is it that celebrity that kind of dulls the person? Uh, I don't know if it dulls the person or we have to consider, well, what do we attach to people that makes them a celebrity for us? What is it that we value in people that makes us elevate them? Because it's, it's rarely sort of real personal attributes, is it? It's rarely integrity. You know, it's rarely doggedness. It's rarely intellect. It's something else. I, I don't know what it is. Isn't it? I mean, it's often seems to me that it's a curation of a certain version of success as opposed to like, really, what you said, you said the word right at the beginning, backbone. It's yeah. like it's, it's, we don't reward backbone often. We no. I, I don't know, maybe maybe in certain contexts we do. You know, if we have an Olympian who has, you know, doggedly, mm. you know, kind of done whatever sport it is, then yes. And we do adventurers, male adventurers, explorers. We didn't with Alison Hargreaves, who did the same kind of thing many years ago. Yeah. But unfortunately, you know, we got it. We, you know, she, she was told that she shouldn't be doing, she shouldn't be climbing this, that and the other because she was a mother. So, yeah. You know, I think we kind of ascribe different different things to different genders and and yeah, I I mean, I'm pretty unimpressed by celebrity and it's it's funny with this podcast, I didn't want to follow the road of simply having arse licking interviews. I mean, because you know, that's after all what it is like, oh, hello, hello, yeah, you're so famous. <laughs> and yet, just because it was a famous name, because that would be some kind of clickbait rubbish rather than, so it's like, it's, I wanted the substance of mm. the conversation to matter. And, and that's, so that's the way we've done it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what I, we've, I've built. <laughs> I interviewed a woman a few weeks ago who, had got a paper cut. The paper cut on her finger had developed into sepsis. Within the space of a month, she had lost all four limbs. Oh. I mean, it was the most sort of, oh my goodness, jaw-dropping story. And so Jesus. I was interviewing her sort of a year on for that. And she said to me, well, you've got to be positive, haven't you? Oh, bless her. <laughs> so if somebody asked me, you know, who are the most impressive people you've ever met or ever interviewed? I'm not going to say, well, you know, oh, that person, because they're famous. I'm going to say, that woman, that woman, she yeah. lost all four limbs as a result of a paper cut. And she's telling me she has to remain positive And she's written a book in order to help other people who find themselves faced with adversity. That's impressive. Oh, that that's is impressive. impressive. <laughs> that's bloody impressive. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So what did your mum think about your interview with Maggie Thatcher? Oh, well, well, she was kind of proud of Sponge. It was a bit difficult because, uh, you know, in Scotland at that time, Margaret Thatcher was not the most popular person, to say the least. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, reviled in Scotland, to be honest. Um, uh -huh. So it wasn't really something that you would be boasting about. But of course, you know, uh, she was very proud of her daughter who, who got this interview with Margaret Thatcher. As I say, it was a dreadful interview because I was absolutely overawed by her. Um, I, I remember <laughs> turning up, knocking on the door, and it really was, in those days, you could walk up Downing Street and knock on the door, and the big burly policeman opened the door, and it was like 
it was like going for a play date when you were nine. You know, it's Margaret in. <laughs> Can I speak to Margaret? Um, and she appeared behind the door and she dragged me in and she dusted the, the sort of fluff off my collar, straightened my collar. And she said something about, you know, wanting me to look smart for my mum. And you know, I was, you know, it was like, you've been framed or something. I thought, is this real? And then afterwards, I thought, gosh, that was so clever of her because although she was lovely to me, she also kind of infantilized me with an Yes, I can hear it. Mm. Uh, because that was me, you know, 13. And so we sat down in the Ormolu mm. room and, uh, you know, she had her handbag over her uh, crook her of her knees, elbow, I remember. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> and then she was sort of looking around frantically and I was thinking, what's wrong, what's wrong? And she wanted somewhere safe to put her handbag. And she eventually went round the back of one of the couches and she stuffed it, you know, underneath the back of the couch. And I'm thinking, there's six secret service men in this room. Who are you really thinking is going to nick your bag? You know, just because I'm Scottish, it's not going to be me. Um, <laughs> And then, but she was lovely to me and she showed me out the back window. In fact, I'm looking at a photograph I've still got on my study here. And it's the two of us in silhouette from behind. And she's pointing out Horse Guards Parade and the various things behind. But in so doing, she completely took control of the interview. And yes. actually, the reality is, if I could let you hear the original tape, I will always be grateful to a particular fil film editor who sat up all night and with a scalpel, because that was the way that we used to do film back in the day, took out me going, mm-hmm, 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 which I did for about an hour as she spoke. Just a nervous tick that I kind of had. And he took everyone out, God bless him, to make me sound as if I was still on the planet. <laughs> How adorable. And and what an incredible strategy to take command of you. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. Um, you know, hands up, you're the boss, you win. <laughs> but I learned a few lessons, that's for sure. Yeah, and I imagine it was pretty a big coup, actually. Uh, yeah, no, it was. It was really good for me. And I got a couple of awards off the back of that. I, I got an award, actually, I flew to the States, to Minneapolis, to pick up an award from Cher Height. That was a, a real wow. honour, you know, meeting her. Uh, so at that stage of my career... It, it was a great thing. In fact, that was the highlight. It's been downhill all the way since. <laughs> oh, rubbish. Oh, absolute rubbish. <laughs> Come on. Didn't Cher Height write some really saucy stuff? Oh, the Height Report. It was very yes. famous at the time about the sexual habits of, uh -uh. Um, I think it was men and women. She died recently, actually. I remember she? I listened to it on the radio and I thought, wow, well, she was um, quite the person. I must go back. Actually, I thought when I heard that she'd passed away, I, I would go back and sort of refresh myself. But um yeah, she was a huge name at the time. Yeah, I haven't thought about it for many years. Wow. Okay, mm. we'll make sure that's in the, sh the the show notes. So our listeners who are so much younger yeah, <laughs> will know, we'll know. know who we're talking about. She Quite was like the antithesis house. of Mary Whitehouse at the time. Oh, completely. And, and Kay, the other day I, I uh, recorded with Erica Young. Oh, uh, right. Well, in the same kind of genre then. Yeah, exactly. The same kind of era, same kind of genre. And oh, my goodness, that was a bloody hoot. I won't spoil too much, but... Oh, I'll, uh, I'll listen to that. I, I will mean, listen seriously, to that. I mean, seriously, when you get someone like Erica Young telling you the kind of sex she likes, you know that you've... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> You've opened up a treasure chest. And, well, it was I've just, really funny. I've just done a quick Google and, and here she is described as she dedicated her career to documenting the sex lives of women. Yeah, well she, well, well, she has, but she rarely talks about her own sex life because, of course, all of her all of her novels, people assumed it was her. And, and so she tells me about that. So when I when I looked up the word nerve, because I thought I'd better actually make sure that I'm not using some awful word in a in a about you know some kind of derogatory manner, and it says the will to do oh, yes. something bold, daring, or impudent, and I I quite like that because that does kind of suit you. Dare yeah, well, I say it? Well, thank you. I take that as a compliment. But but you're right, actually, because as you were speaking there, I thought, well, is it ever going to be derogatory? But then you think of the expression, well, you've got a nerve, haven't you? Exactly. You've got a nerve, young lady. <laughs> especially <laughs> especially young girls, you see. So I was thinking, yeah. oh, am I missing something colloquially here that I really ought to know about? This idiom might be wrong. Anyway, the boldest, most daring, impudent thing you've done. I want to hear about it. 
Oh gosh, God, oh my goodness. It's so bad when I, I wish I had prepared something for this. What is the boldest thing I have ever done? But see, it's interesting in that in terms of, well, for instance, deciding, right, I'm going to get an interview with Margaret Thatcher. I guess that is pretty bold. But to me, that doesn't feel bold because I was kind of brought up to do things like that. If you don't ask, you don't get. My dad always said, if you don't ask, you don't get. And also the other thing that he said that's always stuck with me, and I always say it's kind of the, the, the mark of my journalistic career, is never be afraid to ask a stupid question. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've never been afraid to ask a stupid question. But where I am not so bold is in terms of my personal sense. I'm, I have more confidence in, I, in my brain than I do in my body, if that makes oh. sense. I'm getting all confessional now here, aren't I? And so Go it's, on then. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, in a show like Loose Women, which, you know, they do stupid things. I say stupid in the nicest possible way, you know, dress up in stupid gear and sort of, well, I mean, I I remember lying semi-naked in a bed of cabbages. Don't ask me why, because I blooming can't remember. Um, (laughs) Whatever were you doing? Oh, God knows. They come up with these mad (laughs) schemes, you know, and I just, you know, they say, oh, right, Kay, this is what we want you to do. Let's just get into that nude underwear and uh, we're going to lay you in this bed of cabbages and it's going to be on a trolley and you're going to be dragged into the studio and, you know, and they're sort of going through this and I'm looking at them and inside my head is screaming, I don't want to do this. I do not want to do this. I do not want to do this. I do not want to do this. Um, And then you think, oh God, you're going to look like such a prat if you don't. You're going to have to do it. But that kind of stuff is difficult for me because I don't have that confidence around my, it's not my sex you know, my sexiness or anything, but I suppose it is about my personal physical form, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, my blessed mum, who I've been so critical. You mean your body? Yeah, I mean, my mum, who, you know, as I say, I, I absolutely adore, but she did say to me, I remember it once, and, well, come on, Kate, it's not that you're ever going to get a job because of your looks. Oh, you know, she <laughs> oh, did- <laughs> thanks, mum. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, she didn't oh, mean that badly, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, she was she was steering you towards your brain, but unfortunately, indeed, indeed. <laughs> yes. but unfortunately, she kind of diminished my confidence in my physical self a little bit. Yeah, unintended um, impact, mum. Indeed, indeed. Um, and so that has always been my weak spot. So, in terms of boldness, where I am comfortable, you know, in my my gob and my brain. Yeah. Then I will push myself out there where I'm not comfortable. I mean, say something like Strictly Come Dancing. They're never going to ask me to do Strictly Come Dancing anyway. But if they did, I would have real difficulties because I just don't see myself in that way. And I would find that enormously difficult. You know, it would be a huge challenge for you then, wouldn't it? I mean, because it would trigger loads of stuff. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, can, I can imagine. Yeah. Was that, I mean, I did Celebrity Mastermind and there's a lot of people would say, oh my God, I would never do that. I would never do that. What if you get, you know, you're stupid. Whereas, I mean, I was okay doing that. I mean, I'm not saying I wasn't nervous, but I was, but I'm fine doing that. But Strictly Come Dancing, I would brick myself. <laughs> yes. But what's interesting though, is that on Instagram, you're so much more, I mean, you're, you're stupid. Yeah. Very. Yeah. You, I mean, you, you play daft, yeah. silly. I mean, you're not stupid. That's clearly bloody obvious, but I mean, you, you act it, you'll, you'll be daft, you'll be silly, you'll do pranks, you'll, so, I mean, surely it, doesn't it look like you're, or are you curating that it looks like you're much more comfy with yourself or is it because it's planned and you're in control of that and um no I have a really really silly side to me yeah. you know I mean when I was at school I was the joker I mean I was always the one who was winding up the Latin teacher by you know blacking <laughs> out my teeth and you know just doing crazy things and that's a real part of my personality and I think that is why I enjoy doing loose women because it allows me to have that bit of my personality and in terms of Instagram because I mean I have nothing invested in my Instagram I don't make money out of my Instagram. I'm not looking to make money out of it. Oh, it's brilliant, you know. Kay. I love your Insta. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just my little silly, silly zone where I get to indulge 
a bit of stupidity. And, you know, particularly in the last, not just the last year, obviously, with, with coronavirus, but you know, the past four years have felt pretty heavy going, haven't they, politically? Brexit, what's happening in the States, you get a bit worn down by it. Uh, well, I certainly have got a bit worn down by it. I don't know if everybody else has. And so to have just a little area that you can recapture just some silliness, I think just keeps me a bit steady. Yeah, well, it's a, it's relief, isn't it, to the, yeah. to the pressures that... You know, and it has been a global pressure, actually. Yeah. It really is. It's been bloody serious. And and so to have that, that silliness and lightness is important. Yeah. But it's but it is interesting because that doesn't feel like that's you particularly being impudent or daring in some ways. It's because I don't know. I see you being silly. And so I'm wondering, you know what I really loved with you and Maggie? And whether this was, whether this looked like it on the transcript or whether this is how it happened. You asked her about 23 questions that you revised the same question. Like, <laughs> Maggie, what is it really like to be a woman leader? She didn't answer it. Maggie? Do you think it's an advantage to be a woman leader? <laughs> I mean, like, honestly, Kay? <laughs> I am dogged. I am very oh, dogged. Yes. Yeah, yes. I, I really don't give up easy. It's no. terrible. So I'm like, okay, that was a really nice answer. That was a lovely answer about, you You know, you lose mm. women and a bed of cabbages. But actually, I'm wondering what your most impudent thing that you've done is in your career in life. Yeah, but I don't know is the answer. I I don't know. I mean, do you do you store these things in your brain and kind of categorize them externally? I I don't know. Is it having children? Is it you know? It, I I think we go to our career, don't we? Like my most daring, impudent thing. One of them. I've got a few. I think is having triplets late in life and not selectively reducing them as the consultant suggested, which is effectively oh god, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I could have reduced them to twins or a singleton and that would have been safer. Did you think about it? Uh, I had to think about it for about two minutes. Oh, yeah. But but because of because of my my ability and because my own mother, you know, raised me with that, you know, kind of spirit that you can do this attitude, uh, mm. I I was clear. Like nature will take its course, nature will. And I understand that that might be traumatic and it may mean that I'll have to lose some of these or all of them. But actually, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I will not do that. Yeah. So, and that's not because I'm anti-abortion or anything like that. It was just my, my decision that I would try to see this through and it worked. Yeah, mm. So that was particularly impudent because really in your late 40s with a triplet, massively high risk because I have, yeah. I have singletons very early, let alone triplets, it was unlikely I'd get to viability, which would mean I would lose them. So I did. I did get there. I got there and had them. But nevertheless, that's like really impudent has a real... I'll show you feel to it. And that's yeah. where I think that's where the nerve is. Yeah, I think that's an interesting interpretation of that word. I mean, I, I guess it's not what was immediately in my head. Mm. Um, whereas you're seeing it more as, you know, okay, taking on board everyone's advice and, you know, listening to everyone, but ultimately, you know, having the self-confidence to to go your own way. Yes, exactly. And I know, I, I just reading about you, know that you've that, that doggedness, because where do you get doggedness from? It's a, no, I'm still going for this. I'm mm. going to go, I'm going to get this. I will. You know, it, it's a, it is a spirit that's at the heart of nerve. Well, I, I tell you what I think I, I am beginning to find more difficult and you do have to sort of maybe be impudent to stick your way. Maybe I've had a bad couple of days, but you're talking about it, social media, et cetera. I do feel that particularly with the mixture of social media and celebrity, that the world has become much less sincere. You know, we have become very sort of polished at seeing the right thing and saying what's expected of us and, you know, just dropping these little phrases that actually mean nothing and, and being pretty false. 
but it kind of works because you don't ruffle any feathers and it's what people want to hear and everyone just, you know, sort of carries on and pretends that that's all good. It's becoming more and more difficult not to do that and to actually stick to your guns and say things that might be unpopular. Oh, wow. Which in terms of women, I mean, hasn't there always been a very strong mm. cult of the the good girl syndrome? Yeah. You know, that we have to follow a line. and I mean, it's funny. I, I don't know, if you, well, with your children, they, they span a broad age mm. range. But I mean, so I've got one nearly 14 and one 18. And uh, the older one, maybe a couple of years ago, so right in that teenage sort of thing. And she was sitting on Instagram with her friends. And they were, you know, everyone thinks that, that teenagers that age look at sort of Kim Kardashian and all of these big names. In my experience, they didn't. They look at their peers and they look at their contemporaries and, and they sort of try and work out where they are. And so they were flicking through all these pictures and, and it's all this, oh, babe, you look amazing. Oh, fab. Oh, and all this kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> yes. and, and I said, God, what is that all about? And she says, oh, mom, you know, we sit there, we do that. We put down our phones and then go, oh my God, she looked hellish, didn't she? And I think you don't, do you? Yes. And she says, yeah, but that's the kind of stuff you have to do. I think, oh, this is really dangerous that we are creating two worlds. Yeah, I have uh, I have a seventeen year old and a and a nineteen year old. No, no, hang on, she might be twenty now. <laughs> so oh, you know, they, they keep having birthdays. They these kids, but I have kids very similar, and I, I'm really aware of that. Yes, it's like, oh God, we would never say that. Actually, oh, that's terrible. Have you thought about? You know, they would not say. So there, there, there is this parallel. Yeah. And it's not that you would want them to be rude. I mean, of course, no, they shouldn't course say, not. oh, my God, you look terrible. That's awful. But what worries me is that they they so easily, you know, fall into that sort of false praise and, oh, yeah, babes, look great, hot, 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 psh, and all that stuff, when they don't mean it. <laughs> So we're losing. Sorry, you're just cracking me up over here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, babes. <laughs> oh, you know what I mean. No, I do. Not very good at the you flying language. But, you know. <laughs> no, but what we've got then is how do you access your authenticity when you I haven't exactly. developed it? <laughs> That's it. I'm really worried about the loss of all the loss of, of authenticity. <laughs> Those two are not easy to put together. They're um, not. You know, loss of in authenticity. Because- Kay Adams has now got some kind of list. But <laughs> well, do you know, it's funny. When I did first start to work in television, I got a job down south and um, I, I was Scottish. You know, I am Scottish, but yes. I very quickly developed a terribly, terribly posh voice because it was just much easier to get on that way. And so, I mean, I go, I went like, south of the queen or north of the queen it was terrible um but i remember late one night they allowed me to read the late night news this was central television and so it was on the auto queue and so i don't know if you read auto queue much but you see the words coming up sort of yes. half a second before you know you're reading one word and you can see the word that's going to come up next sort of thing um and so the two words put together were glass ashtray Glass ashtray. <laughs> now, with received pronunciation, that's glass, glass, glass ashtray, ashtray, yes. ashtray, sort ashtray. of thing. But yes. when you're Scottish, it's glass ashtray. You <laughs> glass know, ashtray. Glass ashtray. And I could see glass ashtray coming up, but I was in my posh voice and I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And the assailant was struck by a glass ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Well, oh actually, my god. I mean this this strikes at the heart, doesn't it, though, of authenticity. What we do to try to fit. Yeah. <laughs> you oh know, what we do. And I guess what your you know, your teens and my teens are doing or have tried and in our own way we've done it, is to fit and find where we belong and find our feet, find ourselves. Yeah. You know, we have to. I mean, I, I guess we have to do that, but it yeah. is quite, it, it's quite funny watching our teens do that. But when so much of their world is actually uh, demanding or valuing inauthenticity and insincerity and, you know, just sort of papering over, then 
that's really unfortunate. And I mean, I am very grateful that I grew up in the age that I I did. So, you know, so I went to university in the early 80s. And, you know, I do have something to be grateful to Margaret Thatcher, I suppose, because women then, it was all about power suits and big earrings and proving yourself. And I'm going to have a career <laughs> and, you know, I'm going to have it all. And I mean, okay, that didn't quite come to pass, did it? But, no. <laughs> you know, the vibe was very much about, take me seriously, I'm a female and I'm a ball breaker and you know, I can do whatever I like. And now it saddens me to see my own daughter. It feels like it's gone backwards. You know, it's all about fitting in. You know, it's about being a certain type. It's looking a certain way and saying the right thing and not stepping out of line. Mm-hmm. And I think, wow, we've gone back. I think we have uh, the, the kind of homogeneity, the yeah. the trying to trying to merge rather than... Well, that's it. I mean, the internet, Tim Berners-Lee, when he came up with the internet, I mean, what the great hope for the internet was diversity, wasn't it? That we would have this window in the world and that, you know, we would see such cultural diversity, racial diversity, diversity of thought, you know, that we would be exposed to so many different influences. And actually what has happened is that we have narrowed down yeah, I mean, I, I see it particularly in, I'm, I'm grappling, I'm actually grappling in a parallel thought process. I'm grappling with, who did you just say created the internet? <laughs> just so you know, I'm going, oh my goodness, was it not Zuckerberg? I'm kind of teasing you, by the way, but... <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's all right. <laughs> I'm stepping into the shoes of others. I'm like, I'm mm-hmm. sure this is going to really blow minds. <laughs> <laughs> So, sorry, listeners, I'm being a bitch. And <laughs> they're used to me. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I see it on Instagram. I, I, I deliberately, deliberately will not show off my pretty frilly dresses. I deliberately won't have a handbag that I'm looking at. Maybe I should just do a parody. I, actually, that's the thing. That's the other option, isn't it? That what we what we then do is we we've got the choice to put put out material that is that is the parody of what we're trying to expose. Yeah. And I see so many, so many women I absolutely adore who are in their undies doing reels. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just like <laughs> I love them. And I do then question, so why aren't you doing that, Danusha? Like one of the one of the things could be like, if, uh, as a mother of 10, I've had 11 children, you know, one was sadly still bo- bo- born, I can't even say it, but mm. Madeline was still born. And, and so I get asked, you know, I expect you've got, you know, you must be wearing some tight undies to keep it all in. I mean, geez, <laughs> the, the comments are really awful. But I think I ha- I could, I could get in my undies and say, look, this is, you know, like, this is what happens when you have lots of children. Nothing, by the way, <laughs> nothing. Yeah. But, no, but it's nothing. It's nothing unusual at all. But it's almost like the questioning of, of uh, how do I contribute to that? Do I need to contribute to belong? Do I, do I have the nerve to get my undie? Do well, I, I do think we things? all have to do our own thing. I mean, my yes. dear, dear friend, oh, Nadia Sawala on Loose Women. <laughs> Oh, yes, um, I'm glad you mentioned her. <laughs> it's in her undies all the time. In fact, I was just looking at the Daily Mail before we, we came on and, and she did a little piece from Loose Women Today with her tights, her crotch round about her knees and standing in her undies. Um, and it's strange because I've known Nadia for such a long time and for most of the time that I've known her, she was very, very, and she will say this, you know, lacking in confidence about her body on a beach. I'd be on holiday with her. She would never, she'd go into the swimming pool with a sarong on. I mean, you know, just really, really uptight. And she has shed that. And she is really out there. And she does all these posts taking the mick out of Kim Kardashian. I love um, them. And I, yeah, I love them too. <laughs> and it's a wonderful thing about it. And sometimes I look at it and think, oh my goodness, why don't I have the nerve to do that? And I think, but that's just not me. Yes. And I, I love the way that she does it. And she does it really well. And, and I think, I think it's a great statement for for a lot of women, but we shouldn't be forced into doing stuff that's not for us. You know, and you should and I shouldn't. And, and going back to my silly Instagram, you know, that is my alter ego. 
is, is silliness. You know, I've got reasonable confidence in my ability to string a sentence together. And so I can afford to be silly on my Instagram. Um, so, you know, that's my other side. I don't want to get my knickers out. And so I'm not going to do it. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's how we find what's not for us, what's for yeah. us, but what's for us. And that we don't need to have the nerve to do everything. Like no. I could do it. Of course I could. I've made the choice because I haven't done it. You can be sure I've thought about it and I haven't done it. I'm just not going to, you're never going to see me do that because that's not where my, that's just not where my strengths are in life. It's not, yeah. I, you know, it just doesn't suit me. And I think that that's it. If it really is for us, it'll be, it. we'll know, we'll know what we need to be doing yeah. rather than forcing ourselves to add into, I think it's because we feel we ought to. Anytime there's this ought, I think, yeah, yeah that's interesting. Why must I ought to be doing that? Yeah. And it- Everything gets diluted, doesn't it? I mean, you'll get, you know, you'll get, um, okay, nobody wear makeup on Tuesday or whatever. Um, pretty sad that we're still having to do that, but there you go. And and the further down the line it gets, the more it loses its meaning. Yes. And actually it's just copycat behavior. And, and therefore, what does it really mean? I mean, Nadia believes in that stuff. She has genuinely been on that kind of journey herself and it's real for her. If I was to try and do that, it would just be a bit naff. And actually, all I would be doing would be looking for attention. And it's that fine balance between actually saying something that comes from the heart and, you know, looking around and thinking, oh, that'll get attention, I'll do that. And I think that we're back to authenticity aren't we? Are we doing that because we really feel that and because we really think that's an important thing to say? Or have we scanned around and seen what's getting the most followers and the most likes and we're just jumping on the back of it? Because that's where it just starts to feel a bit, you know, icky to me. Well, it does. It do- It really does. That's that's brilliant. And I, I mean, I, I'd hate to see Saida suddenly yeah. feeling the need to... Yeah. Kind yeah. of, you know, it begins when you start to think about other people, it's like, well, they wouldn't because it's not for them. And yeah. I really love that phrase, that's not not for me. It's yeah. like, for them, good for them, not for me. And although it's good that it shows, you know, alternative bodies and that not everyone is super slim, etc. Again, it's back to this focus on our bodies, on our physical self, our physical self, our physical self. I think as women, we, we need to... To, you know, break that down a little bit. We're more than our bodies, whatever bloody shape our body is. Of course we are. And I think one of the biggest sadnesses when I take my um, teenager to college and I see less and less and less clothes on the girls and I'm looking at her and it's December, early December as we record and and I'm seeing she's in a, she's in a basically a, a beautiful little satin basque. I mean, I don't know why. But she's in it. I mean, she's in it with a little, sweet little cardigan with pearls on it. Now, sometimes a boob tube in winter underneath a coat. I'm like, why am I not seeing any men, boys of 17, 18, feeling the need to have boob tubes on? To have, you know, to have so much flesh on show. And I've really been talking about this with my older uh, daughter and like, I know it's not because I'm like, oh, look at them. That's not. No, it's I'm really wondering why the the amount of the flesh is so important to have on, you know, like on show and and that their bodies are so much a sight of obviously a sight of choice. My body, my choice, as my seven year old says, <laughs> by the way, she already says it. So that's, Good for her. that's great. I love it. But. I don't want that to be women's currency. Yeah. It's not our worth. Yeah, and it's a very fine line. Of course it's your choice. Of course, if you, you whatever you want to go dressed in is great. How little you want to dress is great. But let's be honest, is it an informed choice? You know, and what is that choice informed by? Is it really an active, confident choice? Or is it what you think you should be choosing. And I mean, that that's deep, deep stuff, isn't it? It, um, it is. But we have to look that straight in the eye because it's too easy just to say it's an, I, I don't, did you see, we're, we're wandering off the point here. I'm, I'm just gabbling away on your podcast. I'm sorry, but uh, did you see I May Destroy You? 
Oh, I haven't yet, no. Oh, it, it's absolutely brilliant. I've Michaela read Cole. reviews, and yeah, but brilliant. I haven't seen it. And Well, I really recommend it, and it explores so many of those kind of themes. What is choice? Is that really choice? You know, uh, you know, female empowerment, is that really our choice, or is it something we're being allowed to choose or forced to choose? Do, do you know what I mean? It's, uh, yeah, a very interesting discussions. Yeah, exactly. And 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 it for me it relates to nerve because when we get the nerve to do things, we actually do have to unpack whether we're getting for me I do anyway to to unpack are we having the nerve to do something because we feel under pressure or is this something that is going to be empowering for us or is it just you know what what's the what's the role of nerve in our life mm. I, I definitely I don't I, I definitely talk to my kids about it not necessarily using that word I use backbone a lot which is a very yeah. unpopular word I don't hear anybody hardly in my life talking about backbone it's really one I don't know my mum used to talk about backbone yeah and so I was raised on having a backbone showing up you know doing what you say and so I I like that but nerve I mean I yeah I don't know we yeah could go on forever couldn't we yeah I, I think there's much more there's much more scrutiny these days that makes it difficult I mean I, I'm kind of jumping onto you talked about my mum and you know how did she turn out that way my my mum was brought up in this tiny little village um, in the middle of nowhere in Scotland I mean it was basically um, two rows of house council houses facing each other um, that went on for about a quarter of a mile and then countryside again and I remember talking to her and saying did you know that you were poor when you were young and she said you know we didn't because every single person lived in the same house and they really were they were identical all of these council houses were identical nobody had a car um you know when one person got a television the rest would get it you know so materially yeah. they all had the same thing and because obviously at that time you didn't particularly have the access to the outside world that we have and you certainly didn't have the internet etc there wasn't this constant awareness of other people who were leading fabulous lives you just thought this was kind of the world and it gave actually her a tremendous freedom because she wasn't comparing herself to other people all the time because she already knew everyone was in the same boat. So she could dream her own dreams. Oh, yeah. And think, right, so I want to be a midwife. That's what she wanted to, to do. And nobody in her family had been educated to that level. And that was her dream and she achieved it. And then she went on to, to set up a business with, with my dad. But she wasn't sort of weighed down with all these expectations and comparisons that children today will have. Because as far as she was concerned, she was in this little world. She was as good as anybody else. And she grew up believing she was as good as anybody else. And what really worries me about our kids growing up, and I see it in mine, is they're never as good as anyone else. There's always somebody better looking. There's always somebody more clever. There's always somebody richer. There's always somebody more amusing, always. And that drips into their head. Whereas my mum grew up in a poor little mining village in Scotland, believing she was as good as anybody else. Oh, yeah. Unhooking from this comparison is, honestly, I think comparison is a, an, an epidemic that we have to do some work on. Uh, it's It can be used positively, I think, comparison. But at the moment, it has the power to be so negative, yeah. both in women's lives, actually, but definitely in our young people's lives. And, and uh, it's something I'm, we're very interested in. I've been working on a comparison, a, a solution around comparison. So it's, I, I never even thought we'd talk about this. But yeah, I, it's something that um, I'm deeply interested in because you can't turn comparison off. So how can you how can you use it positively? And that's what we have to do. We, because you mm. can't you can tell people just to stop comparing. It's a thief of joy. It's a thief of everything. But we're human beings. We, we're going to compare, and we can't not with technology now. So how do you work with it? And I think that's that is one of the big things that we have to do some work on. So yeah, I'm I'm going to be going to be setting that free in 2021 actually that work but yeah be interested was, to see that yeah yeah this is this has been an absolute pleasure Kay I really loved it and thank you so much oh well good and I hope I haven't wandered all over the place too much I've got a terrible habit of doing that but I've really enjoyed it too thank you 
If you enjoyed this episode, and I really hope you did, I'd love to hear from you. You can leave a rating and a review over on Apple Podcasts or email me on hello at schoolformothers.com. That's hello at schoolformothers.com. Well, that's all for now, listeners. Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a fantastic week and, of course, stay safe. Sending you lots of love. Thank you for tuning in to the School for Mothers podcast. To continue the conversation and keep your dose of inspiration up, head over to schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast where you'll find bonus content from Danusha and her guests on habits, recommendations, books, best apps, time-saving secrets, life hacks, health, sleep and anything in between. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. 